Okay. Good uh, morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, for one of the last sessions today uh, on DevOps. Um, thanks for being so numerous. Uh, it's always fun to see. Today, um, me and my colleague uh, Mario, who sits over there, who will join me in a minute, in a minute uh, we're going to talk a bit about image recognition, how you do that. Uh, we developed uh, a product that you can use to identify clothing. Maybe you saw it, we had a booth on, uh, on DevOps this week on the exhibition floor. Um, and we're going to tell you a bit about how we developed uh, the deep learning network um, and how we developed the interface uh, to work with it. So my name is uh, Ben Vermeers. Uh, I work for InfoFarm, uh, part of the Explore Group. We specialize in deep learning and big data and AI stuff. Um, and Ida, they specialize in all things web and Adobe. But uh, Mario will probably talk about that a bit more. So over to the image recognition part. Um, how do we do that? How do we do you work with image recognition with deep learning? So what have we built? Um, well, the first question was, uh, can we build something that can uh, identify clothing? Um, so based on the images that are feed, uh, feed it into uh, the computer, they wanted to see what's on the image. Is it a suit? Is it a t-shirt? Is it a blazer? What color does it have? Um, does it have long sleeves, short, le short sleeves? Is it striped or not, or plain color? Um, so you wanted to be able to identify all of that based on the imagery that we got in. Um, but when we built that, um, we noticed that it was also very suitable to build recommender systems um, because when you uh, can identify images and see what's on there, you can use that information as well to identify similar images and recommend those images to users. So that's what we've built. We've built a prototype um, and in the end we've built something that can be used in stores uh, and is actually used in stores right now um, with a, a gesture interface that was developed by Ida. Before we, I get into the specifics of how we built it, um, maybe it's a repetition for some of you, but I don't, don't know who attended all deep learning talks this week, um, but a bit about deep learning. Um, deep learning actually is a special kind of machine learning. We all know the traditional machine learning, so what's the big difference? Um, in traditional machine learning, say, uh, for example, you want to see if something is a car or not a car, um, in traditional machine learning, you have to extract all the features that identify something being a car by yourself. So you have to write some logic to see, okay, a car, it has uh, two tires and it has some windows and it has a trunk uh, and I don't know what, what else. But you have to extract all those features from the imagery yourself. And then you can use those features and build a classifier system saying this is a car or not a car or this is a car and this is a truck. The big difference with deep learning systems is that the deep learning systems do the feature extraction for you. You just feed it with a bunch of examples. Uh, in the case of images, you feed it with a bunch of cars or trucks or cars or not cars. Um, and the network itself, it tries to ex extract features from the imagery um, and in the end classifies those features into something being a car or not a car. And we did the same thing for uh, clothing, but you can do this for yeah any type of obje object, of course. So a neural network, network, how does that work exactly? Um, people always say uh, neural networks, they try to mimic the workings of the human brain, uh, and you train the human brain to recognize objects. Um, so when we think of uh, brains that still need to, uh, to develop, we think of babies. So meet, uh, meet Sepp. This is my son, he's uh, about one year old uh, now, and he's my, nearly my most advanced neural network that I've trained to date. Uh, my wife doesn't really like me calling him a neural network, but yeah, what gives. Um, but my son actually is a neural network in itself. Um, so my, my son, he really likes uh, toys and balls. So the, what he's really good at right now is identifying something being a ball or not. Um, so how does it start? Okay, my son, he sees a lot of balls. So he knows, okay, this is a ball, this is a ball, this is a ball. And then he, he tries, he, he 
a pattern emerges from all those images of balls and he sees, okay, a ball, it is round. So I know that first thing is a ball and the, the second object, that's a ball as well because it's also round and the third object is a ball as well because that ball is round. Um, but then my son, he wants to play with the ball and he tries to pick up the last ball and he notices, okay, th this ball is kind of heavy and I can't throw around with it and when I kick it, my feet hurt. Um, so he gets a second example of something not being a ball. And if I say enough to my son, okay, this last green thingy, that's not a ball, but that's a watermelon, then my son will learn, okay, large, heavy green things that are round are not balls, they are watermelons. Um, and you do the same thing for uh, training neural networks on a computer. So you feed it lots of images, lots of examples, and in the end, um, the system learns what it's fed and tries to extract features from it and it can detect what features belong to which labels. And we did the same thing for clothing. So we uh, gave a lot of images of clothing to our network and said, okay, this is a t-shirt, this is a blazer, this is a suit. Um, and in the end, um, our system was able to recognize clothing. And we, we used some special kind of neural network called a convolutional neural network. Um, which actually takes small parts of the image and tries to extract features from it. So it starts by, for example, using the uh, left outermost pixels, 4x4, four four, um, and then he scans the entire image. And he goes along with it and it builds a new image from those small features. So in the first step, you uh, will probably detect edges and, and small objects and, and lines. Uh, when you go over it. Um, and in the end, you add a second layer and a third layer and you do it over and over again and then you get uh, lapels and buttons and really identifying features. You can do the same thing, for example, with faces, uh, detecting eyes and eyebrows and mouths and in the end trying to detect um, what mood someone is, is in, if he's happy or not. Same, uh, same pattern emerges there. So that's a bit of how the network that we used works in the background. So how did we train our model? model? Um, well, by feeding it lots and lots and lots of images. Um, we actually used uh, approximately 300,000 images of labeled data saying, okay, this is this type of clothing. Uh, it has this kind of pattern. It is this kind of color. Um, and we used a stack uh, of Keras for the modeling with a Teano backend. Uh, and sorry to say, but that's all Python based. Um, okay, um, I like Java as well. Um, but for now, Python is most suited to train uh, and work with neural networks. You also have something called uh, Deep Learning for J, which can actually use Keras built models as well. So we're looking into that, but there's still a performance hit. So for now, we still stick with Python. But I think everyone will understand all the code examples as well. Um, we started just doing CPU-based training, um, but um, we ended up buying uh, just one uh, performant GPU card because that goes a lot and a lot faster. So uh, if I can give you a hint, if you, can, if you get started with this, invest in a good GPU card to do your training because it will speed up your development cycle a uh, hundredfold or a thousandfold. So over to some code. Um, how do you create a model in, uh, in Python? Um, so the first thing you do is just you create a new model. So that's the initialization of your model there. Um, and then we say which shape we will feed into the model. So in this case, we had uh, images of 128 by 128 pixels with three layers, so red, green, and blue layer. Uh, if you have only black and white, you only have one. Um, and then we add different layers into the network. So the more layers we have, the more features we can distinguish. Of course, this, this, um, this doesn't necessarily scale or is useful to scale into a bunch of layers. I think we ended up only using three or four, um, because every time you advance a layer, you use more and more of your image or more and more of your features. And in the end, you end up with your, all your image and then it just starts to get confusing for the network. So we had a bunch of layers, uh, so the convolution 2D layers that are uh, used in a convolutional uh, neural network. 
And in the end, we add a classifier layer, a logistic classifier um, that uses the features that come from the other layers to say, uh, to classify this is this object, this is uh, a suit, this is a blazer, this is a t-shirt, this is a dress. And in the end, you just compile that model. And then you have an object, uh, a model object, uh, that represents the uh, hierarchy of your model, the layout of your model, um, that you can start training. So how do we train that model? Um, by feeding it lots and lots of images and lots of, lots of, lots of, lots of labels. But how do you do that in code? Um, so we take the model that we previously initialized and then we use the fit generator method in this case. Uh, why a generator method? We can also use um, the regular imagery, but using a generator we can create more and more images based on one on original images. So what it does is it shifts and it rotates and it adds some distortion to the images in order to get a better trained model. Uh, because obviously the new images that you're getting in aren't always that clean. Um, so that's an easy way to add more and more data. So we feed our RGB data from our image uh, to the generator to generate more and more images and the labels uh, associated with that image. So for example, if I uh, have an image of myself, I say, okay, this person has a blazer and it's blue and it's plain, for example. Um, and then we also yeah, have some configuration and in the end a callback method. So what that callback method does is save your model to disk. Uh, well, in our case, it can do other things as well. Um, so this means that in the end your trained model is persisted and it can be reused as well. Uh, you can load it in, load it from disk, transport it to other systems, even put it on mobile or something like that. Um, and start working on it further. You can even use it as uh, a layer in other models as well. So that comes in handy when deploying to a server, for example. Um, and after doing this for thousands and thousands and thousands of images, and after a couple of hours and a couple of days of trial and error with fixing, and fixing the model, you end up with a trained model that you can use to categorize images. And categorizing images is just plain and simple, you open up your image uh, and you take your trained model, say, okay, predict the classes for this new image, and then uh, the model says, okay, this new image that I get in uh, is an image of a t-shirt and it's white and it's plain, or it's an image of a dress and it's uh, a long dress, a blue dress, and it has a floral print, for example. Um, so it really, yeah, it looks quite simple. Of course, there goes a lot of tuning in developing the right kind of network and selecting the right kind of images, but I'll get to that later. Um, but just code-wise, it's actually real simple. And Keras also takes a lot of uh, the conceptual modeling out of your hands. So in the end, it's, it's not as hard as most people uh, think, it's, think it is uh, before starting with it. So we can categorize images, and this is, for example, uh, the output of one image that we had. Um, so if, I f if we feed in this image of this uh, fine lady here, um, and it's entirely unreadable, um, but it says, okay, this is a dress, that's the top one. It is black mainly, and it has a floral print. print. Um, the cool thing here is that you don't only have um, the first bet of your model, but also your second and your third best bet. Um, and optimizing for 100% accuracy on the first bet is really, really hard. Um, but you should also look at accuracy uh, in the first three bets of your model, uh, because that can also be used in products. For example, if you want to use this to uh, automatically categorize uh, imagery or for, for you have a new catalog in your store that you want to uh, put in your system, they can, you can use the system and the bulk of images will be uh, right from the first try. With the things that you're uncertain of, you can feed to um, a yeah, manual operator who can check it and you can also present him, uh, him or her with the second and third options that your model came up with, so to make the selection easier. Um, so now we've built a model and that model can detect uh, what's on an image. Um, so the next thing we wanted to do is use that model or the features of that image to recommend similar clothing. So how do you do that? How do you uh, 
um, tell your model what is similar and what is not. Um, one thing you can do is train a model uh, separately for detecting similar items. So it will work kind of in the same way, feeding two images and saying, okay, these images are similar, and then the model detects what is what are features of similarity. But what we did is kind of a different approach. Um, we used a traditional uh, model of nearest neighbors to detect similarity in images. Because the model, it comes up with a bunch of features, um, I think a thousand something features that we have for every, for every image. And those features that can be used in a traditional way, using traditional machine learning and recommender systems to do recommendations and find similar feature uh, vectors. So what we did is we just got rid of the last step of the model you saw previously in the slides, uh, which was the classification step of our model. Uh, and if you get rid of that step, uh, you just end up with the raw features of that model. And we can use those raw features and put them in a feature matrix. And then whenever we get a new, a new image that we want uh, to find similar images for, we just get the raw feature vector of that image find the nearest neighbor or the most similar feature vector for that uh, image in our catalog. And then we have a similar image based on the catalog that we already trained. So how do you do that? Um, you take yeah, the truncated model is uh, the original model that we had for the classification with the last layer omitted. That's a truncated model that we created. Um, and we use the same predict method to get uh, the feature vectors now, not the labels, but the feature vectors for the image. Uh, and then all of those feature features, they go to into a feature matrix. So for example, you have a catalog of 1,000 images, you have 1,000 feature vector, vector, vectors sorry, in a matrix. Um, and then we can use something called uh, the SciPy library in Python to, to just build a tree um, and use that tree to find the nearest neighbors. So it's as simple as querying uh, that tree with the new image features for a new image that we take into our systems and say, okay, I want uh, k nearest neighbors. So for example, 10 recommendations, and then you get 10 new images in your system. So um, to give you an example, the same lady here, um, if we feed that into our catalog, we get uh, these recommendations, if we get the eight first ones. That's where we see uh, we all get dresses, they all have floral prints, they are more or less in the same color. Of course, the lady itself is also taken into account a bit, so the blonde hair counts as well. Um, but yeah, it's still a work in progress. So what have we learned by doing this? Um, First and all, uh, use your GPU. <laughs> it makes your development cycle a lot and a lot faster. You don't have to wait for three days for your new model to train. Um, the last percents or the marginal wins are really, really hard, as in every uh, machine learning model. Um, so you, you will first have some quick gains, but then really specific cases can become quite hard. Um, and a quite important one is that the only thing uh, your model will know is what you, what you learn it, what you train it for. Um, and you have to be really careful uh, not to introduce bias into the model. Um, I'll give you an example. If, um, and that's actually the case, uh, for example, for blazers, every blazer in our training set uh, is a blazer with a closed button which means if I take a picture of myself with a closed button like this, the model will detect, okay, this is a blazer. But if I take a picture of myself with my blazer like this, then the model will think this is a cardigan because the lapels in here are really cardigan-like and cardigans are all opened up in our feature set. So if you want to detect both opened and closed blazers, you will have to feed in imagery of both opened and closed blazers. Um, because this is the most distinguishing feature for a blazer. The same goes for suits, for example. The only thing to get, the only way to categorize something as a suit is uh, when you wear a tie. If you don't wear a tie, it's never a suit. It's because everyone wearing a suit in the training set had a tie. Um, and the hard thing, that, and that's a great distinction of between deep learning and the traditional machine learning is that uh, the deep learning model it it 
chooses the features itself, and you don't really know what it, those features will be. Okay, there are methods to see what the features are. You can use deconvolutional neural networks to visualize them even, but still, um, the training set is, is really important for the outcome of your model. Um, and the last thing, indexes in Pandas, uh, it's a, a data frame a library in Python. They're really, really hard to work with. So I still prefer Java over Python, even after this one. Um, so now we have a fully functional recommender model. Um, but of course, yeah, we're kind of back-end guys, so we didn't really know how to build a nice interface for this. So we contacted our colleagues from uh, IDA, saying, OK, we have a very cool model that we want to use in stores, but we don't, uh, uh, yeah, you have to take pictures, so you have to take some distance from the screen, so we're looking for a cool interface to work with to put in stores. Um, and that's what IDA has developed. So I'll leave the word to my colleague uh, Mario to talk about the interface that we built before this model. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, everyone in the room and everyone uh, watching us on YouTube. Um, so yeah, my name is Mario van den Ende. I'm a web architect over at uh, Ida Media Foundry. We are a um, everything web company, and uh, we also do uh, Adobe Experience Manager. Um, but I want to talk to you uh, about how we came on building the whole front end and pieces of hardware that um, InfoFarm used to um, build the whole experience. But I want to start off with this guy. Um, if you don't know who this is, this is Tony Stark. Tony Stark is a billionaire philanthropist, and he's also Iron Man. Uh, when I first saw uh, the first Iron Man movie, um, I was fascinated by the technology that he had. Uh, now, I know this is not real. Um, I know man cannot fly in suits like that. Uh, but he uses very advanced technologies like holograms. So, for example, if you look at this, um, he uses his hands, he uses gestures to interact with content that is floating in midair. And I was actually wondering, um, how can I achieve the same experience using hardware that is um, available for me. Now, I'm not a billionaire, so I can't buy all this stuff. So I wanted to find a way that I can build this myself, affordable, with the technology and the scripting languages that I know. Um, so here you have another example. So he uses gestures to rotate stuff and zoom in and zoom out. So um, I wanted to ask myself, yeah, how can I, for example, represent a click? If I see things floating in front of me, how can I select things? How can I move things? How can I navigate through content that is actually not touchable? Um, so the question was, how can I achieve this? And uh, using programming languages that I know and what's the hardware available. So I tested a lot of sensors, um, all of them uh, from webcams, to version 1s, version 2s of uh, hardware devices, uh, motion leap uh, hardware devices. But one of them stood out um, above all, and that was the Microsoft Kinect, version 2, not version 1, and the development kit. Um, that piece of hardware did actually everything that I wanted. Now, what did I want? Um, it measured up to... Uh, half to f almost five meters, so that's um, quite amount of distance. It can track up to six bodies, so if six people are in front of the camera, he can detect, oh, there are six people in front uh, and that I can interact with. Uh, furthermore, it can track up to 25 joints, and that is very important, and you'll see that in a later, uh, later slide, why that's very important. And you can see them on the right. Uh, from all the way to the head, all the way to the feet, um, every joint can be detected. So that's very important. It can also track uh, the hand state. More on, more on that uh, later. But also, yeah, I want to know where my hands are in, in uh, a special place and time. Um, 
Also, you have a unique, a unique skeleton ID, which means that uh, every person that's being tracked stays or gets the same ID every time. So he knows that you are person A, and if you move to the left or the right, he knows that you are still that person A moving. Um, it goes up to 30 frames a second, which is more than uh, our eyes can see. Um, it can measure depth, which is also very important. So I was al already thinking that I can... Um, if it can measure depth, I can move things in uh, 3D space. And it does face tracking and emotions. Now, I haven't tested this yet, but uh, in a future project, this will uh, come in handy. So basically, when I saw that, I was like, yeah, I need this. So um, I saw it, I bought it. Uh, we currently have four at the office. Um, that's how addicted, um, at least I am, to this uh, piece of hardware. So the setup is actually um, very... Uh, very basic. So you have the piece of hardware, the Microsoft Kinect. We have a very high-end um, uh, desktop computer to hook it up to. And then uh, a Samsung uh, display that we can put in uh, portrait mode so that we can um, yeah, actually see our whole body. So this is all very basic and all very affordable. Um, so the hardware, yeah, okay. Checked, we bought it. Um, we hooked it up, it worked. What was the next step? Yeah, how do I get the data from that little box onto my, um, to the desktop and into my application? So yeah, how do I get that data? The only programming languages that I know is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I don't know C Sharp, uh, I don't know .NET, uh, I don't know Java or Python or anything else. It, it had to be JavaScript. So front-end-wise, yeah, this was a no-brainer for me. I used this uh, day in, day out. Um, so we, we used ES6 with uh, a WEC, uh, Webpack bundler, uh, a React front-end, and a Babel transpiler. So we had this off the shelf. This was uh, set up in five minutes. Um, and then I started thinking, OK, what do I have to use as a back-end? Since it's JavaScript, I had to use Node.js. I know Node.js. Um, but then there still wasn't a connection from my device to um, the Microsoft Connect. Um, so I had my fingers crossed and I searched the web for uh, a node module or an NPM module that would actually um, do this for me. I didn't think there was already someone in the past that was crazy enough to actually do the same thing. But yeah, thank God there was. So there are on the web... Uh, two GitHub repos. Uh, actually, the second one is a fork from the first one. Um, but we use the, uh, the second one be because it uses a different edge. In this case, edge.js. Uh, now, in short, what's an edge? It can just connects two nodes. For example, you have Node.js and a .NET. You have two processes, and it gaps the bridge between the two of them. So you, your Node.js environment can call .NET um, functions and vice versa. So in our case, it had to run a C sharp command from Node.js because if you check out the the repo, uh, you have access to the code and it was in C sharp. So um, all right, fingers crossed it worked and eventually it did work. So uh, I had my hardware, I had my setup, uh, I had a Node module that hopefully worked. Awesome. So um, I spent my days figuring it out. Saw the first sample application, and this is actually the only pieces of code that I had to create my Hello World app. So what you see here, if you are familiar with uh, web technology, um, you import your Kinect 2, you instantiate it. If the Kinect is found, you see all the lights go on, you see uh, all the output. For example, the console open, it says, OK, your um, Kinect is connected. And basically what this piece of code does, it just outputs JSON. Um, JSON information to the console, and after five seconds, the application stops. And if you get um, the console log that lists all the bodies, then you know your uh, connection works, and now it's just a matter of a way, find a way to get that data into your application. So if you look at how this uh, JSON looks like, so this is um, body index zero, 
up to uh, five or six. This basically is tracked, the tracking ID, it's unique, uh, as I said uh, earlier. And then the hand state. The hand state, it can go up to four states. Um, so when it's closed, a lasso, not tracked open, and um, unknown if your hands are, for example, out of uh, the field of view. Now, the lasso tool, that's something different. Um, I didn't know what it was, I had to Google it also, but basically a lasso tool is, um, if you know, we're all familiar with computers, of course, if you have the little index that goes like this, basically the lasso tool is adding a second finger. Um, now, why is that? Um, basically because the device measures depth, one finger isn't um, big enough to uh, bounce the rays of light uh, off, so you have to use a second finger um, to actually um, see the state of the hand. So that's basically it. And then you have all uh, depth X, uh, the colors, the cameras, orientation. It can detect if your hand is like this, like this, your head goes uh, left to right, stuff like that. So now this was just basically um, finding the right coordinates uh, to do the math with. So the hardware check, getting the data also worked. Now creating an awesome app during a sunny vacation in Italy. So while my girlfriend in the next room was packing uh, all of the bathing suits and slippers, I was packing my Mac, my, uh, my iPad, my everything, piece of devices that I need, and uh, yeah, I was up and running. Um, so basically what the idea was, um, I wanted to create an airplane in the browser that I could control with the Kinect. So basically what this means is um, if you stand in front of the device, I asked my little niece, like, uh, how would you portray flying an airplane? And immediately she goes like this. So you have two wings. Um, so, okay, yeah. so I, I was already thinking, I have these joints. I can measure the joints. And uh, how would you um, go up? And she bent her knees. Okay, and then the airplane went up. And then the, the, the next issue arose, yeah, how do we make it go down? We cannot float yet into midair. Um, so that were things that I need to tackle. So the steps I need to, uh, to take, I had to learn 3.js. 3.js is a 3D library. It's very powerful, um, but I had to learn things like geometry, lighting, um, how to load external objects, uh, how do cameras move and interact. Um, so I downloaded uh, an ebook and uh, started reading. Um, the, next, the, the next thing is, how do I get the data from the Kinect into the application? Because now it's just still running on the back end, on a separate server. And how do I map my body that's actually in the physical world, how do I ma map these coordinates to the, co the coordinates in the digital world? Uh, these were all things that I need to tackle to actually make the plane go um, up and down, left and right. So putting it all together, yeah, I had to debug, basically. I had to draw myself as a skeleton on a canvas, all right? Next, I had to pl uh, place an airplane into 3D space. I just downloaded somewhere at, uh, an object of a little airplane, uh, placed it in there, and uh, if it showed up, I was already happy. And then I had to make it fly. Those were actually um, the three steps. So this is what it looked like. So as you can see, this is actually skeleton data. Every red block is actually my head, my shoulders, uh, my upper torso, my waist, my hands, my, um, my legs. My feet are not in there because they're not important at this moment. Um, but actually, uh, the state also from the hand can also um, be uh, checked. So green was open and blue was closed. Um, so basically, this is how this looked. So this is me standing on uh, my terrace on, uh, on our holiday home in Italy, surrounded by uh, tens of other people I don't know, looking at me like, what the hell is he doing? Um, my girlfriend sitting next to me reading a comic book, because she's addicted to comic books. Uh, and I was like, yeah, yeah, it worked, it worked. And she just lowered her comic book, going like, what? What are you doing? And then I explained everything to her, how this works, and yeah, she thought I was cool again. Um, 
So basically, how is this made? Uh, it, actually, if you narrow it, narrow it down, it's, it's very simple. So I had a, a local host running on a separate port um, that was connected to uh, the, the device itself, giving me JSON data. Um, and every time a body frame event occurred, the, the device just spat out uh, events uh, called body frames. Every time that event occurred, I just pass it along a socket, and then I had the front end listen to that same event on the, on the same socket, and then the data would be passed. It's, it, it's very easy, actually. So now I had a bridge between my back end to my front end. Um, the data was coming in, so now it was just um, a matter of, um, of math and, and JavaScript. So this is actually the piece of code that um, gets the data in. Uh, I clear my canvas because the canvas gets um, removed and filled in with all the uh, red dots. Um, I loop over all the bodies, and if the body is tracked, at this point only I was crazy enough to stand and do things like that. So uh, there was only one body at this point. I created um, the little red blocks, and then I have a, a method, uh, update hand state, that would control uh, if my hands were closed uh, or open, and then the elbow state. And the elbow state was actually the most important function. Um, because what I did was, if I stand like this, I had the coordinates of my elbow on the, ref on the left and on the right. And then I would measure the distance uh, between uh, this and my uh, center point, like this. So if I went like this, the plane would go that way, if not the other way. So that's basically um, the way that I tackled this. And this is actually w uh, how that looked like. So um, if my elbows are practically on the same line, we're leveling, the plane just goes straight. If my uh, left elbow is uh, higher, then we go to the left, otherwise we go to the right. And we output it to the screen. And if the jet is loaded, we just rotate uh, his Z position and um, we're gone. Now, we had everything. I tackled everything. It was a proof of concept. And uh, yeah, it worked. So um, how could we translate everything that we know into the clothing analyzer? Yeah, again, what is a gesture? How can we navigate through the application? Um, how do we define a swipe? Um, and how do we translate all of this to code? Um, for example, a mouse click. Um, a mouse click we can interpret in, in, in many different ways. For example, um, do you go like this? Uh, do we use the whole lasso tool? Um, or do we uh, implement something that if you hover long enough over an element that's on screen, we would show um, a little indicator. And if the indicator is um, fully filled, then a click would occur. Or would we go like this, and if a fist, uh, if, if your hand is open, make a fist and open again, is that a click? Now, we had so many uh, different opinions that the, basically the only thing we could do is ask people to come stand in front of the camera and just start uh, you know, doing things intuitively or naturally. And uh, basically the r first result was um, something that I call the Beyonce. Um, every person, and literally every person that tested the application, th uh, they went like this. Really, so they they asked uh, they asked us how do we click and they all went like really like this to, just to tap, um, but then we explained yeah it, it's not working like that um, so we implemented the whole uh, circle thing if you hover long enough over an element. So um, yeah, the version one we know how to um, go to gestures. It works, so we measure the distance from one point relative to another point. But there were uh, very, um, yeah, there were a lot of issues actually. Um, is the UI intuitive enough? So practically not. Um, the app started lagging after a couple of minutes, and really, really lagging. At a certain point, it would ultimately freeze, and we had to reboot the whole application. 
And the third-party libraries that we um, included uh, couldn't be wrapped into an Electron app. If you don't know what an Electron app is, basically it's a wrapper that uh, enables you to create web applications uh, and uh, build them as uh, a DMG or an XA or something like that, as a really standalone application. And inside, a Node environment gets, uh, gets spawned and uh, a Chromium environment for your uh, front-end. But yeah, of course, we built uh, a version 2. Um, what we did was we um, connected the Kinect to a separate, wor a separate worker JS, which was basically running on a different thread. Uh, it would still send the body frame information. We compressed the data image because it was full HD. It was uh, too big, so we compressed it. And we were uh, in control of the frames per minute instead of actually running code every uh, uh, color frame or body frame uh, event. So we were in charge. And we had to rebuild uh, the Kinect libraries that we used to a specific Electron version. Um, this was actually the most time consuming, and thank God for Google and Stack Overflow. Um, but eventually it worked. Uh, we got it up and running. Uh, we made a standalone application, uh, and it's still working um, today. So this is basically the setup of how the uh, application works. We have the Electron wrapper. Uh, in the node environments, um, services get spawned to upload photos to uh, S3, um, and the worker JS to connect to the uh, Microsoft Kinect. And there is an IPC main and an IPC renderer. Basically, that's the bridge between what the user sees and what's running in, uh, in the backend. And you can send events over it just to uh, ask data and get data synchronously or asynchronously. And then uh, the Chromium web browser is basically yeah, a Chromium web browser that just um, spawns up the HTML and running the React application and um, everything's up and running. Um, so these are a few screenshots of um, early UI. You had to tell the, the application that I'm a male or a female. Um, once that was done, you get a little um, a, a little uh, text that says this is how the application works. So you can swipe. So for example, we detect uh, this hand uh, position in time and space relative to this point, and if it was past that during a second or, or two seconds, it would swipe left, and this would swipe right. And then, if the, if the application took your picture, it was uploaded, uh, some yeah, magic thing happened uh, in the cloud, and we get different versions back in a JSON array, and uh, we just yeah, made it look pretty on screen, and then using swipe gestures, you can uh, navigate to the next and to the previous one. But also, um, we had to know if the results were accurate or not. So the last uh, screen was, yeah, did the results that you were given, were they, actu uh, were they accurate, yes or no? Um, and after 10 seconds, the screen would just disappear. You jump back to the start screen, and the whole flow just uh, starts over again. So basically, that's it. Um, I want to thank my uh, girlfriend for loving comic books when we were on holiday, so I can do cool stuff like this. Uh, the colleagues over at Ida Media Foundry, um, especially Marco Lambrecht, who's actually um, the brain behind all of this for uh, coding it, uh, figuring out how the whole swipe thing and math. Uh, Laura de Winter and Astrid van der Hasselt, who are our creative geniuses, uh, and everyone who tested the application. Um, and there's one more thing. Um, I started the, the presentation, or my part at least, with the whole Iron Man thing. Um, he has one other awesome piece of technology, and it's called Jarvis. If you don't know what Jarvis is, uh, I suggest you Google it. We are working on it, and maybe this is something very interesting that we can do next year. Um, this is mandatory. Um, we're hiring, so um, also Ben and I, uh, InfoFarm and Ida Media Foundry. So uh, there's maybe one thing that I want you to see. Um, oh, that's big. Um, can you see this? Yes. This is actually um, a proof of concept that two uh, students of ours did, basically using the same technology. Um, 
you can configure um, your clothes, for example, uh, a t-shirt, a hat, um, your trousers, and your shoes. Just by going like this, I want to select the, the row. And if you have selected um, a style, it gets mapped onto your body. Now, these are, these are all very low poly um, models, but if you have very detailed models, um, basically you can do um, just stand in front of uh, a digital mirror or something like that, or even in your living room, and just try out clothes without even leaving home. Um, so what they did is they um, embedded functionality to control the lighting, um, the size, stuff like that. And at some point, I even think there's uh, something like a dress in there or something. Yeah, all right. So yeah. So this is Tess, our male model. So that at, at this point, you can already see that the lagging is occurring. So this is, so as you can see, it's a little lagging at a certain point and just, it just died. So, um, so this is something that I worked on during my uh, free time. Um, a, little, a lot of cool stuff is uh, happening in the future. So, um, all right, thank you all for listening and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day.